<laughs> your pets. Yes. You're going to want to take your dogs with you. <laughs> Actually, uh, this guy brings up a really good question. What if you do have pets? Um, oftentimes, That's, violence yeah. against pets is, is a really big issue. And yeah. You get them out of there, too. So... Yeah, uh, what would you do in this case? I Absolutely. think he might be blocking your face. Can you, can you scoot a little bit, buddy? You can, you can come up with us. <laughs> like, no, I'm say only my joke. Come here, come lay down. Come so, um, definitely the the actually uh, our local shelter here will take pets um, depending on the circumstance. But I would definitely call like your local shelter and see if that's an option for you. But a yes. lot of people will um, offer like about I think about a week and a half, about ten days. Um, of free like shelter maintenance where they can that's stay awesome. there. I, I totally yeah. did not know that before today. That's really good to know. Yeah, because I mean imagine like let's say that you're bolting to a motel or a hotel like how many take animals? Yeah, you seriously. know, or you're starting over in a new apartment and you can't fathom trying to come up with like $500 that it costs to pay a security deposit for no. well, not security pot but a pet deposit on top of a security deposit on top of you know a double month rent or whatever. Yeah, seriously. Um, so the Humane Society here will generally allow that, um, or finding a close friend, the same thing with finding a safe place for yourself to yeah. go. If you can find someone that's trusted, that won't talk to um, the abuser yeah. to, to place your pets at. So that's just one less thing that when you're in a state of survival and crisis that you then have to be concerned about. If you can put them somewhere where you trust that they're safe, yeah. then you can focus on you know what, what the next piece, the next step. That makes sense. Okay, so so pets, obviously, that's a really important piece, but I, I would say, I mean, I'm a huge dog person, as you guys know from seeing all my dogs <laughs> uh, in the videos, but kids, uh, yeah. kids are more important, and oftentimes they're involved and make the situation that much more complicated and difficult. Sure. What are some safety tips and safety planning tips when children are involved? Sure, sure, and essentially, um, similar type of piece there. If there's someone that can watch kiddos while yes. you're trying to, you know, figure out what what your plan is or where you're going to go, um, but also being able to have um, conversation with your kids that essentially says if if you feel scared, this is what you know mommy wants you to do, or is this something you feel safe doing? Yes. So maybe like a lot of kids will say hiding under my bed feels safe or feels comfortable. Okay. Um, do kiddos, you know, at a certain age, you're not going to give um, certain information to a two-year-old that you would to a ten-year-old. No. Um, but maybe, you know, a cell phone for a ten-year-old where do you know how to call 911? Do you feel comfortable calling 911? Yeah. Um, and with older teenagers, particularly, you want to very much so enforce safety within the home that they aren't trying to get in between an altercation. Okay, Because yeah. you'll very much so see that, especially with um, male teenagers yeah. who want to protect mom. Yes, for the long time. Yes, and so the one piece of advice I'll always give is just to the best that you can encourage them to never be involved in the physical altercation and to run. And if there's a close neighbor yes. that they trust, um, for all kids, a good yes. neighbor can be really, really good because that can be somewhere really close. It's hard to get lost if it's you know just a door yeah. or two doors down. Yeah. Um, and if they're trusted to be able to then call whoever you need to, whether that's a family member, a friend, um, you know, police department, whoever, yeah. that they're then able to make that call there where um, abuser can't hear them making that call. Now I know, and um, and that's, that's awesome advice, I know in a lot of situations isolation is a huge piece Absolutely. of abuse. So let's say someone's in a situation where they've been isolated from friends and family mm -hmm. or friends and family have given up on them because they are in this abusive relationship and their friends don't think they should be, I mean you see sure. that a lot. Um, if someone does feel extremely isolated and like they don't have people who would help them, what are options that they could turn to? I definitely, um, there's definitely several crisis lines that you mm -hmm. can start with. If there's a physical altercation happening, yeah. I would always call 911. Yes. So if you call like a shelter or a crisis line, um, there's wonderful advocates and counselors mm -hmm. that work to be able to just give you a space to build a new support system yeah. um, with them particularly. Yeah. Um, and I've called them before and they're great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the only issue then is, is that if you're in a current physical altercation, that if you call that line, yeah. we cannot then you know, send someone out to you. Yeah. So I would still you know, call 911 and then use crisis lines as a place to get out how that felt. Yeah. So maybe the next day or the next morning, like this is, you know, this is what happened to me last night. I had to call the police department. I don't feel yeah. safe. What are some things that I can do? 
and I would absolutely, and they'll tell you, they'll tell you similar things about, you know, safety planning and yeah. what, what's your next step? Are you planning to stay? Are you planning to leave? Are you planning to leave later on? Yeah. Do you have pets? Do you yeah. have children? You know, and how can we help keep, keep everybody involved safe? Um, but isolation is a huge barrier to overcome and a good step can be to reach out to a crisis center, a women's mm -hmm. shelter, a place like that where you feel like they know what's good. They can understand what's going yes. on and can give you well educated and well experienced advice on what your next steps could be. Yeah, and I think that I think that's a, a huge piece too because then generally, at least you're talking to people who actually get it, who actually sure. understand and aren't going to give you stupid answers and unhelpful comments. Sure. Again, for the most part. Um. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Sure. Nobody's perfect, right? Yeah. Sure. But there are incredible organizations out there who really can help and who can hear what you're going through. And, and right. And this is a place where you're not there. just going to hear why, well, why don't you just leave? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you just leave? Yeah. Clearly it sounds like that's a safe choice, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So you're going to get more helpful information that's, um, that's very survivor sensitive and very um, well, you know, well put together, well educated, and well trusted yeah. in that regard, for sure. And I know when when we were talking earlier, another big piece of like why don't you do, why don't you just leave? Even though there's like that's such a huge question to answer, sure. but um, I think it's seven. It's you're seventy percent more likely to be. Um, murdered leaving an mm. extremely violent relationship when you leave. Absolutely. Which is why it's so important to have a safety plan in place. And mm -hmm. so um, I think that's another reason to be very cognizant when, Absolutely. You're, when you're planning. Absolutely. I don't, I don't think people understand the ignorance of that comment and it mm -hmm. isn't because they're purposefully trying to hurt your feelings and no. not understand what's happening. No. I think it's that the brain can just not fathom that type of experience and we put, we try to put ourselves in a survivor's shoes literally yeah. but we don't know how unless yeah. we've been in that boat you know yeah, and so I didn't know before <laughs> we just hear we just hear, I mean you would tell any friend that let's say you go out to drinks on a friday night and one of your closest friends is like well my boyfriend's cheating on me yeah or this is happening leave know? the jerk and you're like oh yeah he's you know you don't have time for that right yeah. you don't have time for that girl just take off yeah um and so it's, we're just so used to hearing that that we don't specifically understand the dynamics that make it so risky to tell someone that yeah. And since we were just talking about safety planning, I would absolutely say that to anyone, is that you cannot just tell a friend who's experiencing domestic violence to just leave yes. because they are so much more likely to be harmed at a much more dangerous level yeah. than they were before because domestic violence is all about power and control. Yeah. And once you break up with this person or you tell them that you're, you're going to be moving on, all of that power and control that they've worked so hard to hold over you is now gone, poof, yeah. like in, in flames, right? So they're going to do anything to grasp that back, which can include um, life-ending altercations, and that makes it so much, so much more risky. And, and speaking of that, what are, some, um, what are some of the big red flags when it comes to violent relationships? Like we, sure. we talked before about like strangulation, that's a huge Absolutely. indicator Absolutely. of uh, much worse to come, I guess you yeah. could say. Sure. Um, what what are some other things to so, watch out for? Strangulation especially? <laughs> generally tends to be something that you get to in a relationship. Mm -hmm. It doesn't usually domestic violence tends to escalate, and everybody's pa uh, pattern of escalation is different. Sometimes yeah. this is within six months. Sometimes it's twenty years. Sometimes it's three dates. Rarely is it that, but yeah. it can be. Yeah, I've yeah, met survivors absolutely. where that has been the case. Same here. Um, so I think strangulation is a red flag, but it's more like at that point you probably already know something's going awry. Yes. The reason why it is so dangerous is because not only because it, you can die that way, yeah. but because it takes so little. Yeah. So I think I think we were learning the other day that it takes less than I don't know the weight of a small child amount of yes. pressure to end a life via strangulation, and so it, yeah. it's because it doesn't take a lot of effort, and because. With hitting and kicking and biting, it is violent. It yes. is unacceptable. It is abusive. Yes. But it generally is a way to take out anger and rage as opposed to strangulation, which is only generally purposefully used to end a life. Right. And that is what its purpose is. Yeah. Um, and so that's why it's so incredibly dangerous is because that means not only are you at higher risk because of how little pressure it takes, but also because that means that partner is willing in that moment to take your life, which yeah. means if they were willing at one point, they will be willing and at another point mm -hmm. to take your life. 
But as far as red flags are concerned, to get to, get to that uh, to get to that place where it, you know it doesn't usually happen on the first date, where no. you're experiencing something incredibly risky, like strangulation. Yeah. But all those power and dynamic, like power and control dynamics, they they start to appear fairly early. Yeah. But unfortunately, and particularly in my case, um, I was dating as a teenager, so yeah. everything feels romantic and exciting, and they can really feel like things like that. Oh yeah, like, absolutely. Like I only want to spend all my time with you, yes. which you're like, oh my gosh, like I feel so special she loves because me, or she loves me, yes, or like, whatever this it is. person <laughs> is just so into me right now. That, yes. And and that's pretty normal, you know, when you start dating someone new you're like I want to spend all my time with this person because yeah. I just met them and we're clicking and we're getting together and things are going really well yeah but if you see that that starts to become an issue for the other partner where it isn't just something that's enjoyment yeah. but there's a lot of jealousy with friends with um, people of the same and generally more often opposite sex friends yes, right um, family members even um, they start telling you things about your friends that they don't like and you know I don't like your friend so and so because she's always so dot 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 it's yeah. you know just anything yeah same with family that's where that isolation piece you were talking about happens yeah so isolation um, getting into something serious really quickly like oh we should have a baby or we should get married oh, yeah and again sometimes it feels like oh my gosh like this is so exciting and we're so in love like, yeah we should do that yeah yeah, but that can be a huge red flag because you have more power and control in a relationship when you're legally bound. Yes. And we talked about pets um, and children a little bit. And once, you know, once you have a child, that's a whole other struggle to then leave that partner. There's more emotional struggle there. There's more financial issues if you're trying to make it on your own at that point. And yeah. So there's just a lot of red flags and that type of behavior as well. That makes sense. Um, and if you notice, this is one thing I didn't pay attention to a lot, but I see a lot with clients now, is that you notice that you're giving a lot, up a lot of things that you used to really enjoy that you just don't do anymore. Right. Especially if they're things that take place outside of the home or outside of the relationship that that partner doesn't take a part in. That makes That's sense. That's a huge thing. Yeah. Any, like your identity, like pieces, yeah. of, pieces of who you are. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Because essentially what, what I hear from clients a lot is that it feels like the abuser wants to become your only everything. Yeah. And so if you don't have outside um, friends and family, that's that's one good step for them. But then also to take away other coping skills and other things that you do without them. Yes. Everything needs to be with them because then they feel safer as far as being in control of what's happening yeah. in the relationship. Right. That makes sense. And again, it's yeah. the control thing. They're in control yeah. of everything that you're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And then um, we talked about strangulation, but uh, sexual violence of any kind. Yes. Like manipulative behaviors, coercion. Um, if you really loved me, you would do this for me. Mm. That's one that I hear a lot. Yeah. And, you know, even as an adult, not just as a teenager, that's something that you're like, well, what, you know, what is my role? And, yeah. you know, sex is just kind of a messy, taboo topic as it is. And yeah. So we don't bring it up. Yeah. You know, right. at all. And so you're trying to figure out these things in a relationship on your own, like what, you know, what is my part or what is our part? But I think you can notice that if things either don't feel consensual or you feel like you're doing things you never wanted to or always thought you never would, yeah. that can be a really good sign that you're being abused, that you're being coerced to or sexually exploited. Yeah, that well. makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And so those are some of the biggest like red flags. Yeah, as you sex develop is a relationship. happening too soon in a relationship for you, and you feel uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. it's but it's happening anyway. Yeah. Or okay. um, when you're sick, or when you're not feeling well, or um, oh, yeah. I've heard uh, clients say like right after they've had a child and they need time for healing. Oh yeah. You know any of those kinds of things, essentially where your partner's sexual needs always come before your own well-being. Yeah. And that's and that sounds obvious, but it's just not. You know, sex is yeah. it's messy. Yes. And yeah. It's taboo, and yeah. so I. <laughs> I think I think that's a huge red flag that I hear a lot.